In this video, we will walk you through the steps we take twice a day during our routine upper air launches. This is one of our meteorologists, Shane. He's on his way over to the upper air workstation. Once there, he begins his work on our evening upper air flight. The object he's holding is one of our radiosondes, which measures temperature, humidity, pressure, and winds as it ascends. On the instrument, he writes information about the time and location of the flight. Next, he jots down information about the radiosonde and balloon for record keeping. Then, it's time to pair the radiosonde with our computer. Plugging in the radiosonde allows our software to recognize the instrument. The red light on the instrument means it has connected to the computer. One of our next steps is to include an observation of current weather conditions, which are used for corrections to raw data. Once initial data has been input, we turn on the radio sound by pressing a small black button. Then, Shane unplugs it from the computer. This ensures that the battery is working properly. We should already be receiving live data from the radio sound at this time, and assuming all goes well, the radio sound will be communicating its location okay. via GPS. Here, Shane first unfolds the parachute to ensure it will work as designed when the balloon bursts. This will keep the radio sound from falling too fast back to the ground. He then ties each end of the parachute to strings, which will be used to connect the parachute to both the balloon and radio sound. Now that the parachute is prepped, it's time to fill her up. The balloon, that is. Shane walks into the adjacent room to start the flow of hydrogen. The regulator, which is the gold device with a black handle, maintains a safe flow of gas into the balloon. There it goes. The inflation process has begun. Filling the balloon takes seven or eight minutes with a safe flow rate of hydrogen. So let's fast forward a bit. What a beautiful balloon. Now it's time to tie the balloon to the rest of the train. First, Shane ties a couple of loops around the neck of the balloon to ensure no hydrogen escapes. Scout experience is helpful here, as a variety of knots are utilized when prepping the balloon and train. Another loop is then added to keep the balloon in place while he finishes the process. For good measure, he uses the remainder of the string to tighten the end of the neck. Next, it's time to tie the radius on to the other end of the train. Conveniently, there is a hook at the end of the radius on used just for this purpose, and we have a hook on either side of our upper air shelter to hang the radius on as we finish the prep. A couple of tight knots, and we're ready to go. Here we go. Everything is ready. Time to put it in the air. This was fortunately a relatively calm day, so Shane can casually walk out of the shelter. In high winds, this process can be a bit more complicated. He checks his watch to ensure we're within the proper launch window, which allows for coordinated launches across the world. Off it goes into the blue South Dakota sky, ascending at around 250 to 300 meters per minute or about 10 miles an hour. Shane loves balloons. Of course, not all of our balloon launches are on nice days. Here are three launches on not so nice days. These launches require significant concentration.
Back inside the office, Shane double-checks the surface data. Then, he begins monitoring data from the radiosound. The GrawMet software allows us to view live temperature, relative humidity, pressure, wind, and height information as the balloon ascends. What does the finished data look like? Here's an example of a SKU-T log P chart, which shows temperature in the red line, dew point temperature in the green line, and winds in the barbs at right, compared to pressure, which decreases with height. Though this plot only shows data up to 100 millibars, or around 50,000 feet, the balloon can continue climbing to around 100,000 feet. Due to the very low pressures at these altitudes, the balloon can be as large as a house before it bursts. Data from our radio sounds and those across the world are used as input data for our numerical weather prediction models, contributing to more accurate forecasts for our end users like you.